So first of all, I'll introduce uh, Gary Graham. Uh, so Gary is a designer with the visionary eye of a fine artist and a passion for process and traditional craft. Inspired by a deep sense of history that goes beyond fashion, Graham references and reinterprets idiosyncratic elements from period influences, eclectic art, and outsider cultures. Juxtaposition is key. Tone and tactility, raw and refined, dark and light, innocence and seduction, fantasy and utility. Signature elements, including washed and dyed fabrics, intricate detailing, fluid silhouettes, contrast and coalesce to lend an ethereal air of romance and discreet drama. The result, a renegade glamour, these are such great phrases, a renegade glamour without artifice that endures from season to season as each collection, how could I improve on this? This is a perfect bio as it is. Um, each collection evolves from the last, imbued with a rich sense of the serendipitous journey entailed. This is poetry, I must say. Um, born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware, Graham studied painting at the Maryland Institute College of Art and subsequently graduated with a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He launched his first collection in 1999, which sold at Soho's iconic IF Boutique. And then in 2006, he opened the first designer boutique at ABC Carpet and Home in New York, right up the street. Shortly thereafter, in 2009, Gary Graham established his first flagship tour, excuse me, store in Tribeca. So we're very glad to have you here. Thank you. So, Hepzibah and her brother made themselves ready, as ready as they could, in the best of their old-fashioned garments, which had hung on pegs or been laid away in trunks, so long that the dampness and moldy smell of the past was on them. Made themselves ready in their faded bettermost to go to church. They descended the staircase together, gaunt, sallow Hepzibah, and pale, emaciated, age-stricken Clifford. They pulled open the front door and stepped across the threshold and felt, both of them, as if they were standing in the presence of the whole world and with mankind's great and terrible eye on them alone. The eye of their father seemed to be withdrawn and gave them no encouragement. The warm, sunny air of the street made them shiver. Their hearts quaked within them at the idea of taking one step further. It cannot be, Hepzibah. <coughs> It's too late, said Clifford, with deep sadness. We are ghosts. We have no right among human beings. No right anywhere but in this old house, which has a curse on it and which therefore we are doomed to haunt. And besides, he continued with a fastidious sensibility inalienably characteristic of the man. It would not be fit nor beautiful to go. It is an ugly thought that I should be frightful to my fellow beings and that children would cling to their mother's gowns at sight of me. They shrank back into the dusky passageway and closed the door. So um, I'm going to start my exploration uh, with my Fall 15 collection, which started in uh, Salem, actually. Um, and I worked with the Peabody, um, Salem Peabody Museum, Peabody Essex Museum. And before I visited the museum, I had to go see House of Seven Gables. And in collections in, uh, previously, I had been inspired by that book. So it was my chance to actually go to the place and, and, and kind of experience it. Um, so what I did with the museum is I went into their archives, which you're seeing here, and they really opened their doors to me. I worked with seven curators. Um, and so when I was there, I was thinking about Hepzibah Pinchon, who I became a, really enamored by in 2008 when I opened my boutique because she, I was reading the book at the same time as I was opening my boutique, and I don't know if you know the story, but she's forced to open a scent shop in her home uh, as she was part of the aristocracy and then kind of had to engage in this commerce. So to me, it was like the American version of um, Miss Havisham in a way. Um, so I was working in this museum uh, and saw probably uh, 
collections in every department. And the, one of the, so I'm just going to go in and out of the story and just, I'm kind of winging it here. Um, but uh, so I, I saw this chair. It's actually a throne. It's uh, referred to as a Zanzibar throne because it's from Zanzibar. And I just fell in love with it. So for me, it was like, what is this? What is it for? I didn't have a lot of information. They couldn't give me a lot of information in terms of who was sitting on it. But what happened is I just, what I do with these objects and material culture and the study of material culture is I try to just start relating to it and, and get into what I like about it. And besides taking photos of it and really looking at it, I start kind of dissecting it and exploring it uh, visually. Um, one thing that I love to do, and I learned this um, when I was work, I worked uh, with Julie Tamor in The Lion King, and one thing that we did was make maquettes and really make things with our hands. And I love uh, working with cardboard and just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of the motifs and the designs. Um, this is kind of thinking about, well, was I in love with the other part, or is it this part? What part am I really interested in? And so this is what starts happening. I just start taking it further. Um, and in, through all of this process, there's other people involved, which I'm kind of, you don't hear them right now because it's just me talking, but there's a lot of other voices. And I think that's also part of the, the process that's interesting, which I really enjoyed hearing the, the first speakers because what I loved about the first part is uh, everyone seemed really generous in terms of what they were letting in and, and thinking about. So this is actually a repeat. I worked with this amazing textile designer, Gina Gregorio. Um, and we collaborate a lot. And so it just keeps going. This is me kind of trying to figure out what are these symbols and what do they mean. If I draw them enough, maybe they're going to mean something or maybe I can figure it out. Um, maybe they'll become more symbolic somehow. And then I start patterning and thinking about it just in terms of where it is and what it is. These are layout technical uh, images. This is something we do called an engineered jacquard. So what you're seeing is the, jacquard, the, the decorative motif and the actual pattern of the garment. And Gina makes these wonderful maquettes, these models. Um, from the computer, just to kind of see scale, because there's two scales. There's scales of the motif, and then there's a very important technical scale, scale of the garment. This is the actual fabric. This is another chair that I love. It's a Vijika Patam chair. It's from India. So it's an Indian technique. It's ivory and shellac, uh, but it's, it's made as a, a, in a Western style. So I started thinking about these two chairs, the throne and the chair. Maybe both are thrones and these two seats. And how they relate to each other. Um, and then um, and also, how are they garments? But garments kind of become, they comes afterwards. And then patterning. There's this idea also when something first comes with like the draping where, and I'm gonna kind of repeat this throughout because this is something that I recently discovered that's helped me a lot, um, is in this phase, there is this idea that possibilities are, still exist, um, but once something starts existing, then those possibilities die. So there's this kind of, there's this, there are all of these kind of moments as things solidify. There are these tiny deaths. Um, 
So I did this. Uh, the museum invited me to do something with the research that I was doing. Um, so I started thinking about an installation <clears throat> and thinking about these two chairs and the two garments and the two people sitting in them and how they can how they would define the garments and the relationship between the two of them. Um, I asked uh, Meredith Monk to collaborate with me um, because I was interested in, in creating a, a dialogue between the two and I wanted to use a non, non kind of language. Um, and so what we did is, she, well, she allowed me to come into the studio with her and kind of uh, separate uh, a piece of hers, a couple pieces of hers, into uh, two speakers. So these are just the plans for the installation. Um, so these are the two mannequins. This is, so this is the idea. This is what I proposed to the museum. Then we collaborated together. And this, this idea and the mapping and then how these, you know, it's, I kept thinking about the image of uh, two politicians, usually men. Uh, sitting in two chairs, and there's usually uh, propaganda, you know, whether it be a flag or textiles behind them representing each country. Uh, so it's just this idea and thinking about what are these, I guess, women going to say to each other? What are these garments going to say to each other? How do their chairs define how they're sitting? Um, and all of this, all of this kind of stuff. This is the mannequin. I was also thought it would be great to have just a set of head, have giant speakers. So there's there's no eyes, it's just, there's just sound. No ears, so you're not hearing, so it's a really, and then uh, sketches. Um, I'll talk about sketching uh, a little later too. Like, it can be such a joyous thing, but it can be such a sadistic, horrific experience um, at the same time. Uh, this is just more kind of process. Uh, this is uh, the Vijayakatam layout of the gown. Um, again, this is uh, Gina's configuring out everything. So I have a fantasy how I want it, and then she really has the challenge and task of actually fitting the scale and the motif and ac actualizing it. Um, this is the installation once it was done. And, and then the next thing, I'm just so you can hear the sound, um, Meredith did a piece in the 70s called Bird Code, which she recorded in a silo. Um, and she really generously let me kind of desecrate her, her work. And we, she was just so great. Uh, she was like, let's just do it. Um, and actually, it was 14 minutes. You're just going to hear a little snippet. So this was a rough draft for a film that we're going to do as just a collage. And then, you know, back to the first image, it was, I was just, I was loading a new SD card for my trip and I just happened to shoot images uh, in my home office. And one was of Meredith and that was John Cage by her. And then 
I think, well, they, they're the perfect Hepzibah and Clifford in a way. Um, so what is that? Uh, this is this uh, another. So I'm gonna, just going to show you the different uh, pieces from the museum. Uh, this is this book uh, was shown to me by Karen Kramer, who is the curator of Indian art at the at the museum. And this is Captain Cook's swatch book of bark cloth from Hawaii. Um, as you can see, it's 1781. This is me looking at it, just um, to prove that I was there. And <laughs> this is again going to um, the 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 possibilities uh, ending is there's so many to choose from. Uh, Karen took it upon herself to contact the Hawaiian authorities about uh, which bark cloths we could use and if it was okay. And um, so that was that was kind of interesting. Um, but again, it's I loved all of them. And even watching this now and looking at, the, at them, I regret not choosing that one or that one. So this is just part of that, that thing when things um, actually happen. This is, this is the one that really kills me. I was like, wow, I, why didn't we choose that one? Um, you'll see which ones we actually chose. So this is just the process of taking it into a repeat and into a pattern. Uh, this is Captain Cook being killed by the Hawaii, Hawaiian natives. It's, it's a painting of that. This is just, you know, kind of, I have this idea in my head, which I'll get to, <laughs> but how is this, First of all, I thought they were from Tahiti, um, and I didn't know they were from Hawaii until like a couple weeks ago because they told me they were from T Tahi they were Tahitian. Um, so there was this this idea. Also, with the museum, uh, the the museum was Salem was the wealthiest port town in America at, uh, at a certain point before Boston, New York. I think um, before the embargo. Um, So there's this idea of trade and this idea of spices and uh, ghosts and you know I like to put everything into the bowl kind of and just see kind of what happens. This is a sampler from 1620. Uh, I have this whole theory about samplers and fancy work and lace making and weaving and it's this idea of uh, communicating and these being mediums uh, that women used um, to communicate and receive communication from other worlds, past and present. Um, there has been proof documented that some of the samplers and doilies have um, been images of things that have happened or maps of places that did not exist that now exist and vice versa. So with Hepzibah, I was going to read one more thing. So Hepzibah, Hepzibah opens the store and you know she's really a pathetic character. She really needs help and uh, Again, it's this, I'm, I, I have two stores, so there's this uh, idea of, um, of retail and, and commerce. Um, without giving herself time for a second thought, she rushed into the shop, pale, wild, desperate in gesture and expression, scowling portentously and looking for better qualified to do fierce, look, and looking far better qualified to do fierce battle with a housebreaker than to stand smiling behind the counter, <coughs> bartering small wares for a copper recompense. Any ordinary customer indeed would have turned his back and fled, and yet there was nothing fierce in Hepzibah's poor old heart, nor had she, 
at the moment a single bitter thought against the world at large or one individual man or woman. She wished them all well, but wished too that she herself were done with them and in her quiet grave. <laughs> really, like, how depressing that is. <laughs> um, but with Hepzibah, this, uh, this interaction with the public that is so funny and sweet and horrific. Um, and I don't know if you guys know about Hepzibah, but the thing about Hepzibah is she's always scowling um, because she's near, nearsighted. And so she's always misunderstood. Um, so back to the bark cloth and the trade, what I start imagining is who's going to help out Hepzibah? Who's going to come to her rescue? Uh, and that's when these women come. Uh, this is also this idea of the port at night and the ship that arrives with these women on it. And they're, they got stuff to trade, or there's stuff they got in their bags. And they're going to come and at night, at midnight, and kind of uh, school her out. Um, actually, Salem was the first place Pepper uh, was brought into the country. And it actually was, um, and you know, it was being sold at a 700% markup. So that idea, too, where Hepzibah could be the first person to sell spices and pepper specifically, so she, she could become prosperous. In the book, she doesn't actually make any money. She inherits it. So I was thinking about how that could change. Um, and then these, what these are, these are experiments with the fabrics and um, kind of take, getting them into, a form, into garment forms. Um, and again, these are very abstract. And what happens is these need to become articles of clothing. Uh, so again, this is where the fantasy of who these women are and what these things uh, can become uh, start to get chiseled away um, into actual garments. Uh, so I'll quickly go through some sketches. Uh, again, these go from abstract and just getting it out. And for me, sketching can be just like a drug, can be such a wonderful thing. Um, but then when, um, when it involves other people, um, it can be kind of a horror show. And I think John actually said it best um, when you were describing how the ego uh, can get into the way, it can get in the way of the purpose. And to me, that's what all of this is about. The drawings are, are kind of, can be ego maniacal, um, and, but it's the process that happens afterwards of communicating and letting things in and figuring out what the purpose is. And it's always a balance, it's always a push and pull. Um, I can look at this now and know that, see that vest, and know that that, dra that drape on the vest isn't happening. I know we tried to get it that way, and I could get really angry about it. Um, or I could just move on. I mean, the good thing about fashion is you just, there's, two months later you have to start again, or like a week later you have to start again, so it doesn't matter. Um, so, and, um, this is the, so this is just an idea for a presentation where the objects are are on images and how do the women relate to them and how do they go in and out and how do the objects objects become characters and how do the objects get pulled into the into the present day and what I really kind of got obsessed with is how how do you fit a certain amount of models around this and how do they not bump into each other so this is just that kind of going around and around. This is just the, the final work. This is what, basically, we made.
this is the final board with the edited. Oh, I, I didn't say also, I left with like 300 objects. You know, I, I edited, I just kept editing and editing. Uh, when I went back to my hotel room, I started editing and so this is it. So this is the woman, this is, this is who I see you coming to help Hepsiba. This is the final. Thanks.